So good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining our panel conducting fieldwork under COVID constraints, interviews, surveys and experiments. Um, my name is Diana Kapaszewski and I will be chairing our panel today. I'm an associate professor of government at Georgetown University. My substantive work focuses on law and legal institutions in Latin America. Um, and I've also written on field method, methods and transparency and qualitative research. Uh, and I serve as the associate director for research of the qualitative data repository. So I want to just offer a few quick notes and reminders before we start. Um, first, we'd like to really thank the Moynihan Institute of Global Affairs and the Maxwell School at Uni uh, Syracuse University for supporting this webinar series. Um, many thanks in particular to Christian Page and Yuri Yu from the Center for Qualitative and Multi-Method Inquiry, who have done a tremendous amount of work uh, helping to organize these panels and are, who are with us here today to make sure everything goes smoothly. Thank you, Christian and Yuri. Um, the presentations today will last about an hour. Uh, and then there'll be a Q&A session. So if you hover your cursor over the lower part of your, you're probably used to doing this now, but if you hover your cursor over the lower part of your screen um, and click on Q&A and click on the Q&A box, you can, ask, ask, you, you can ask a question. So you should feel free to type your questions in there at any time. We would love to pop that thing open at the end and have a queue of like 50 questions. So please, anytime you have a question, um, Put, it in, put your question in there. If you would, it will be a lot easier for us to field the questions if you direct them to a specific panelist. So if you could just preface your questions by uh, Jen, um, Stephen, that would be really, that would be great and uh, that'll help us field them. Um, you can also like questions. So if somebody puts a question in the Q&A and you're like, oh, that's a really good question. I totally had that question too. You can like it and that will move it up the queue so we are more likely to choose it um, as one of the questions uh, uh, that, we'll, that we'll answer. Um, and the questions will be combined and moderated. I'll introduce our moderator in a minute. Um, and he will be looking at your questions, putting them together um, in, in, in logical combinations so that we can hopefully get to all of them. Um, and we really hope you'll have a lot of questions um, and that our time today can be sort of an exchange with you, a brainstorm of, of ideas and reactions. Uh, we're all operating in new terrain here and, and we hope that we can think together about some of the challenges we're facing and, and come up with some useful solutions. And we'll also be sharing some resources on these topics uh, on the IQMR webpage soon. Um, the last thing I'd like to do is remind everybody that this event is being recorded uh, and the link will be posted on the IQMR website resource page. Um, so we are delighted to have with us here today a wonderful set of panelists. Um, if they please each likely uh, like to briefly introduce themselves as I call on them. Um, Jen, could you start us off? Sure. Thanks, Diana. Hi, my name is Jennifer Sear, and I'm an associate professor of political science and Latin American studies at the University of Arizona. My substantive work looks at uh, political parties, political institutions, and representation in Latin America. Uh, but I also do a lot of research on mixed methods and the rigorous integration of qualitative methods. I don't know why I put quotes there <laughs> into mixed methods and in particular focus groups. So I've written uh, quite a bit about um, how to carry out focus groups in, in a social scientific setting. Um, I'm also the co-founder of the Southwest Workshop on Mixed Methods Research. Thanks for having me. And the co-editor of QMR. Oh, and I'm the co-editor of Qualitative and multi <laughs> Research. It goes on and on. Wonderful. Yeah. Thanks, Jen. Stephen. Sure. Um, I'm Steve Glazerman. I'm actually a non-academic researcher. I, um, my uh, job title is uh, Chief Research and Methods Officer at IPA. So I feel like I have to introduce myself and IPA. For those who don't know, IPA is uh, a research organization with uh, 22 country offices in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And we work very closely with academic researchers conducting field work, uh, typically, although not exclusively, on randomized trials. Um, before the pandemic, we had over, typically would have 250 uh, RCTs in the field at any given time. Um, and as, as for me, um, so I was sort of trained as an economist uh, and spent the first 20 years of my career designing and implementing quasi-experimental and experimental evaluations, primarily of education and training programs, primarily in the US and Latin America, um, occasionally working in other sectors. And now, of course, as I, uh, my role is to oversee research quality, methodological in innovation, um, and provide technical support and training to the research teams in all of our country offices. Um, and I work uh, quite a bit with, uh, with PIs um, external to IPA and hope to build some relationships uh, on research with many of you. 
Wonderful. Thanks, Steve. Pia. Hi, everyone. My name is Pia Raffler. I'm an assistant professor of political science at the Harvard Government Department. Um, my work is at the intersection of comparative politics and political economy develop of development. I'm interested in particular in political accountability. Most of my work is in sub-Saharan Africa, again in Uganda. Um, my research focuses on political oversight of bureaucrats, implications for public service provision on the one hand and electoral behavior on the other. I primarily run large field experiments and partnerships with government agencies and civil society organizations with a fair bit of integrated qualitative work that I'll talk about again as well today. Um, I was slated to co-teach the IQMR module on natural and field experiments, and I'm very happy to at least be here in this forum today. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, Pia. And Yuki. Hi, wonderful to be here. My name is Yuki Tajima. I'm an associate professor in the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown. Um, a lot of what I do is uh, it's a combination of what everyone else does, uh, political economy of development and post-conflict situations. Um, and a lot of the approaches that I use are from multi-method um, uh, techniques. So everything from quasi and experimental to uh, qualitative work. So I'm very happy to, to, to be here. Great, thanks Yuki. And our Q&A moderator is Andrew Marshall. Um, Andy, you wanna just say hi and introduce yourself real quick? Sure, thanks. Yeah, I'm Andy Marshall. I'm a sixth year PhD student uh, in the government department at Georgetown. Um, my dissertation research focuses on um, the politics of language policy and national identity, um, specifically in Kenya and Tanzania. Uh, most of my research is qualitative, but uh, maybe like some of you, I'm in the process of trying to move a planned uh, in-person survey experiment to phone survey. Um, so I'm also looking forward to this panel, and I was an IQMR participant in 2017. So I'm very happy to be here in this format. Wonderful. Thanks, Andy. So let me just, I'll just offer a, a few um, framing points to, to get us going, and then I'll turn it over to our panelists. Um, so first, we all know fieldwork is about being there, right? It's about immersing oneself in a context to learn about people and its politics. And we all know that the current situation makes that a whole lot harder to do. Um, so one thing to remember, I think, um, is that in some senses, this is not being able to spend long amounts of time in a context that we'd like to study and learn about and understand isn't a new problem. So it might be new to us right now, but scholars have been creatively addressing, not to say solving, this problem for a long time. So for some scholars, it's a money issue, right? There are political scientists across the United States and around the world who are not able to do field work in their home country context or another context that they want to understand. For others, time is an issue. For instance, scholars who have families and a million other responsibilities sometimes just can't go to the field for months on end or even a month or even a week. So the point is there's a lot of accumulated wisdom out there about how to navigate this. Um, and it would, it, it's, it's a good idea for us all to tap into that. So that's one idea. We can discuss any of these as we go forward. Um, Given the challenges that we're facing, one thing we might do, as we all of our institutions have done in one way or another, is go digital, right? Is to conduct our research, our field work online or virtually in some way. Um, and if we can, that's great. And our panelists will give, uh, will talk a good deal more about this. But I think it's important to think about digital field work as, as different from and separate from field work as we've been used to thinking about it. So the adjective is important. Um, it makes field work a different ball game, a different animal with different dynamics, um, different tools, different technologies, different techniques. So field work conducted online really can't be a replacement for field work on the ground for all the reasons that we value being there and understanding uh, political dynamics from the inside out. So it's a supplement to that. Um, so my guess, my hope would be that once we're on the other side of this pandemic, there will be things that we will adopt and learn from how we had to operate now. Some new strategies for field work may be one. So my guess, and we, again, we can talk about this, is that field work in 23, 2023 won't look like field work in 2018, but it also won't look like field work in 2020. So we don't know what that a future is exactly going to be look like and be configured like, but it's, a, it's an interesting thing to think through. And then finally, to the, to the degree that it's possible, I think it can be useful to try to think about if there are any opportunities that this situation offers on top of all the challenges that it throws at us. Now, it's a little bit difficult to think that there might be something even vaguely resembling a silver lining um, to a global pandemic that is making millions and millions of people sick and killing hundreds of thousands of people. So I am not suggesting a 
lemonade, lemons, silver lining framework. This is a tragic situation for a whole lot of reasons. But are there opportunities or upsides that the situation presents for creative thinking, for pushing boundaries that we had considered pretty hard and pretty fast before, for bycasting gatekeepers perhaps, for researcher safety maybe, for our carbon footprint certainly, for research, right? For instance, you, you can now interview somebody in Abu Dhabi at 10 a.m. and somebody in Buenos Aires at 11 a.m. The fact is you always could, but you weren't thinking about it that way. So what opportunities and different ways of thinking does this, does this situation put forward? I think those things are, are worth considering. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our panelists. Um, and uh, Yuki uh, Tajima will start us off. Yuki, please take it away. Well, thanks so much. I think that's a, a really good way of framing um, a lot of the issues. Um, and um, on the notion of um, sort of the resources or the inputs to, to, to being a scholar. So uh, Diana mentioned time on the one hand and resources on, on the other. I'll add one more, which is skill. Um, and I think what I'll be doing is focusing on time and the skill aspects of it um, and just providing a sort of, uh, sort of bird's eye view of the strategy maybe that uh, young scholars uh, might be thinking about how to allocate their time really, uh, whether it's towards skill development or um, trying to, to actually get research done. Um, so with that, um, you, what I heard is, um, and I've never been to ICMR, but of course I've, I've seen it from afar. Uh, and what, what I understand is a lot of the participants are, are at this stage at the prospectus uh, level, right? Um, and what I always think about the prospectus as is, is an insurance policy um, where we all know that prospectuses aren't, although they're plans for the dissertation, the dissertation rarely ends up being according to the prospectus's plan. Um, and so things will change in the middle. Now, obviously, no one was foreseeing a, a global pandemic that would disrupt everything. Um, that said, now that we know kind of that this is the situation, we can sort of calibrate it against that. Um, and in particular, the first thing I always say is um, the prospectus is really an insurance policy. So you should have a minimum dissertation that is viable uh, at the end of this. Uh, you know, as a worst case scenario. Um, and then have contingencies for sort of more sophisticated, more rigorous, uh, maybe more ambitious dissertations on top of that, depending on what luck throws at you. Um, and you have to create luck. And so that's what I'll be talking about today. Um, and so when we're talking about time as the main resource, um, the first thing I do is I think about, okay, what is, what is the next sort of, uh, point in the road, right? So for many of you, it's the job market, um, whether it's academic or non-academic. Um, if you're an academic, I would always encourage people to, to think six years down the line, even at this stage, to the tenure clock, okay? And then work backwards to see, okay, what do I want to have uh, 10 years, basically? And then once you think about, okay, this is, my, this is the number of years I have. So, let's say four, three, four years uh, until I defend the dissertation, 10 years uh, to, to tenure line, um, to, to the tenure uh, uh, end of the clock. Um, how then do we allocate those years, right? And typically the next year for you all would be, well, that's when I go to the field to conduct my field work. Obviously that's being disrupted. So then how do we sort of think about this sort of in a strategic way? Um, and so what I'll be thinking about is substitutes and complementar complementarities uh, that can help you guide, guide your way around uh, some of the obstacles. It's not going to be a perfect uh, solution to what you have. Um, but the first thing that I would say is uh, thinking about um, how you sequence your activities. So typically, you know, you're asked up until the prospective stage to really sort of get a feel for the literature. Um, how you can sort of identify niches where you might want to situate your, your own research. Um, and then at this stage, when you go out to the field, a lot of it is about sitting in the field and then getting an intuition for uh, how political actors are interacting with each other. What are their incentives? Um, what are their constraints? And then 
really getting a feel for how they think and make decisions. Um, and that's something that obviously um, you're going to, to, to not be able to do through the fieldwork um, approach. Uh, but in the meantime, you can be doing other things. Um, and so I'll, I'll go into that in a little bit, but in, in addition to sitting in the field to get an intuition, there's also sort of the, the, the aspect of theory building that you can be doing, whether that's deductive or inductive. Um, and again, the inductive approach, many of us on the panel have, have used field work to, to, to build our, our mental models and uh, theories that we're going to be testing. And unfortunately, you won't be able to do that unless you've already had maybe a summer preliminary field trip um, in, in your past. Um, and so one of the substitutes that you could sort of use to get around that might be um, to, to try to develop um, your, your, your sort of archival skills. Uh, this is something that I've, I've never done myself, but I've co-authored with someone who has done this. And um, I was thinking, you know, one of the things that since I can't do field work now, um, I'm starting to look into ways of expanding my, my repertoire into archival methods and also just getting deeper into to the secondary literature on ethnographies and histories that are already written up. Because this is something that, this is something I can do and it's something that I, I, I frankly haven't done enough of uh, prior to going to the field. And so that when things open up again, um, I'll be a lot more uh, prepared for um, the type of uh, more efficient field work that, that I think can sort of build on top of those secondary sources. Um, another set of things that can be done in the meantime are research design and obviously um, starting to think about uh, publication. So uh, one of the things that I, I'm really sort of thinking about is um, if, if some of you have done some preliminary field work, um, you can jump, jump ahead already uh, to thinking about how do I maybe even move towards publication really quickly um, in a sort of uh, theory building or conceptual framework type of thing, um, rather than sort of saving that for later, where typically we would say, well, save your, your data until you get to the later stages, um, and then you get to the write-up stage. But since you know, this is where you can reshuffle your, your your, your, your activities, it might make sense to, if you already have some field work, to even start writing things up. Um, and so that's one thing that I would uh, really look into. Another thing is, um, you know, if you have some people in, maybe uh, some of your, your, your fellow PhD students um, who have gone to the field, um, who have some of that experience, there may be opportunities to co-author in the meantime. So this is where I'm talking about complementarities uh, that I think a lot of the time, um, at least looking back in my um, own grad school experience, people tended to do a lot more sort of individual work. And I know that's been changing a lot with the advent of field experiments, et cetera. But um, I think there's gonna be a lot more openness to, or I think there should be more openness to collaboration at this stage. Um, because of, uh, you know, people really realize we have all these constraints on our, on, uh, our ability to do field, field work. So if we can sort of patch together uh, complementaries, maybe I've done field work on one site and then there are other co-authors who have done it in others, we can sort of uh, do comparative research, for example. Um, and then finally, um, sort of once things have moved to a, a stage where uh, we can think about opening up uh, to field work again. Um, it's likely that we will have a lot less time to, um, to, to be able to do it in the, you know, given the, the runway that everyone is on. Um, so what I would encourage is to think really clearly in a sort of process tracing framework. Um, here are the, here's the sort of working um, hypothesis and it's gonna explain certain outcomes. And along the way, you're gonna have key actors making decisions against each other in a tree and really trying to identify who are the key actors, what are the questions that you really need to get for each key actor at each point. Um, and this is something that I actually didn't do early on in my own field work um, during my dissertation. I just kind of sat in the field and tried to figure it out. Um, and the older I've gotten, uh, now that I have, you know, 
two kids and it's been, I've had kids and for over 11 years now. So I don't really have the luxury to go into the field for a long period of time. So I've, it's forced me to be much more efficient. And my approach has been to sort of map out who are the key actors that I need for what aspect of this question along the way. And it's gotten a lot faster. And another thing is identifying the local interlocutors uh, beforehand who are gonna be the right people to, to open those doors. Um, and so if you can sort of map those out and then online really identify through NGO networks or policy uh, networks that you have, who are some locals who could open those doors so that once you have that time to open up into the field, you can actually um, use it very efficiently um, and get what you need done rather than maybe you don't have the nine months uh, to do your field work, but now you maybe only have three months, but you can get a lot done in the meantime. Um, and then finally, the last thing I'll say is um, I've noticed um, different people actually advertising more broadly, but also approaching uh, me individually with opportunities um, related to COVID. Um, so there are a lot of resources that are being shifted around in, in the World Bank, for example, IP, I've noticed as well, that are sort of saying, look, we need something quickly on COVID. Um, and you know, most of you all who are doing your dissertations weren't gonna be doing research on pandemics and public health per se, but, um, these are the types of uh, opportunities where you can maybe think about um, ways in which you can use your skills uh, to help on some COVID research and then piggyback and say, hey, can I insert a few questions here and there uh, to help you uh, answer your questions um, and then answer, answer your own uh, dissertation questions. Um, and this is really how I've actually conducted a lot of my research with the World Bank in the past. Um, the Asia Foundation, others who had certain needs that were um, in terms of doing research that were not exactly what I wanted to, to study, but close enough that I could sort of um, utilize their networks on the ground and their resources. Um, and so I think that is, is one last thing that I would mention that uh, people might be trying to explore at this stage. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll hand it back to Diana. Thank you. Wonderful. Awesome ideas, Yuki. Thank you very much. I'm just going to run us right through. I'm not going to say anything in the middle. I'll have a couple ideas at the end. So Jen, we'll turn it right over to you. Jen Sear, Jennifer Sear. Great. Thanks. Um, okay. Well, thanks to Diana and to IQMR for spearheading this. I'm really disappointed that we couldn't all be together. IQMR is one of my favorite places to be. I was there as a student. I was there as a teacher. And I, I just love it. Um, okay, so what I'm going to be saying is, is um, largely speculative, as I have not yet done field work in a pandemic. <laughs> but I have faced some of the challenges that Diana raised early on, and so there are some, I think, parallels here. Um, and I'm thinking about it currently because I am actually currently in, Ar in Argentina um, trying to do archival data, I archival field work, and I cannot do it because the archives are closed. Um, so we, we all are sort of struggling with this right now, um, and I. But I'm, and I'm, the, what I'm going to suggest to you today are things that I've been thinking about in terms of how I want to move forward with my work. One last disclaimer, I'd like to say that um, this is an incredibly difficult time to do research or work at all. Um, in addition to the difficulties of moving forward with your dissertation, you are probably overwhelmed by the awfulness of the pandemic, by personal responsibilities, and although it may seem difficult, um, I hope you can be kind to yourself. And I hope that you have mentors and people that you can turn to for support. And if not, I hope you can turn to someone at IQMR to talk through some of these issues in more detail if you need to. Okay, so some of my thoughts about field work. The first thing I wanna say is that um, I think it's possible. <laughs> I was thinking mostly about online field work, um, less about telephone-based work. Um, but I know that some other presenters will be looking at that as well. Um, I think it's possible to do interviews, surveys, experiments, focus groups. I think it's all possible to do on, online. I've actually been reading a little bit about this, and you can even do participant observation if you put like a GoPro on somebody on the ground, right, and sort of have them walk around. This is what one of the articles suggests, right? So I don't think this is always the best choice, right? This is a sub suboptimal choice currently, but there are things that you can do, as Diana suggested, to sort of think creatively through how you can collect 
work on the ground. Um, how easy it is to be successful at this will be a function of, I think, at least two things. And those are what I want to talk about, sort of two points I want to raise. Um, and I think these points apply to any data collection method, um, qualitative or quantitative. Maybe we can talk through that a little bit more in the question and answer. The first point I want to raise is that I think background knowledge on your site of interest is going to be more important than ever. Um, you know, one of the great things about field work is just as um, both Diana and Yuki talked about, is just sort of immersing yourself in um, immersing yourself in the place, right? Sort of getting a sense of place, how people act, you know, what they talk about, the music they listen to. All of this, I think, is really important, not just to sort of sort of person sort of feel the personal satisfaction of being on the ground, um, but I think it's really helpful in terms of how we interpret our data, right? In terms of thinking about validity, particularly with qualitative data, are we capturing what we want to capture? Uh, when we think about what interviewers have said, when we think about what's happened in a focus group setting, when we try to put into words what we've observed. Having that sense of place is really important. Now you can't obviously, um, it's harder to get a sense of place um, if you haven't been to the site, right? And if you feel sort of stymied at this point. But I do think there are some options here. Um, you know, maybe you have contacts on the ground that you can speak with um, currently. Um, you know, having these interlocutors are, are going to be really important. And if you don't have direct access to them, perhaps your advisor or someone you know, you can reach out to a researcher who can helpfully put you in touch with interlocutors on the ground um, for a variety of reasons, right? First, to maybe point you to key subjects or key actors with whom you'd like to speak. Um, maybe you can talk with these experts or potentially academics on the grounds to discuss your project, your research questions. Uh, I think there's even opportunity for collaboration here, right? And, and we have to be really careful about this because we don't want to exploit, you know, the expertise of others. We want to work with them, right? And we'll probably talk about that a little bit in the ethics section. <clears throat> so, you know, there, there are ways to get... An, to get around that sense of place. And then I think this sounds very silly. You know, Yuki mentioned reading books, secondary literature on the place that you're interested in. But I also think you should listen to the music. I think you should go on, you know, Twitter. I think, I think you should read newspapers. You really want to sort of immerse yourself to the extent possible through virtual resources to try to sort of have a sense of, of, of you know, putting yourself there a little, to the extent that you can, even in a sort of a virtual setting. So the other um, point I want to make is, uh, I'll, I'll perhaps elaborate this one a little bit more. Um, so I think that online fieldwork or virtual fieldwork or not face-to-face fieldwork, um, that, that the definition of that may change as we become more innovative. Um, I think it's going to be more or less effective, more or less feasible as a function of where you are in the research process, in the data collection process. Um, so. And, and unfortunately, perhaps for some of you, I think the earlier you are in the research process, the, the less committed you're, you are to maybe a research site or a question or a data collection method, and the more flexible you can be. So um, this, I can sort of think about this in sort of three places in the, liter in the, in the research process. So you might be at the very um, initial stage, and I think, like I suggested, this is probably the easiest stage to be more flexible at this point. Um, and you're, you're deciding that you want to do field work on the ground. You know that you can't in the immediate um, sense. So perhaps you choose a site um, of a, a place that you've already been, right? So you, you do already sort of have a sense of place. Maybe you're from a country. Maybe your family is from a place. It's a place that you know intimately for potentially different reasons, right? So Oftentimes we choose these places to begin with, right, to do our field work. Um, but now we're just going to be a little bit more transparent about it <laughs> in terms of, well, this is the place I'm going to choose because it's the place I know best and feasibly it's what I can do right now. A place that you've already been or you might know people, this is where you, it, it, it will be easier to build a network on the ground, I think. Um, you could also stay local, right, and think about doing research where you're at currently, right, and that might be easier um, given what's happening. Okay, so you have more flexibility at that early stage. I suspect that many of you are past <laughs> that stage. Um, so then the question is, are you already committed to uh, dissertation perspectives, for example, but you haven't yet collected research? And this is where I have several graduate students of my own, and this is where we've had several conversations, right? Like, what do I do now? Um, so you've read a lot of literature, um, you've made choices about you know, your research question, you might even have really neat hypotheses that you wanna test. So 
at this point, um, I think it's good to keep in mind what Yuki <laughs> mentioned, um, which is that, you know, we sort of set up in our minds a list of things that we want to do. And that inevitably changes as we collect field work, as we um, analyze our data. So we sort of have to start accepting that need to be flexible from early on. Um, and what I am recommending to my students is to currently, you know, think about sort of your wish list of everything you want to do with this project if you had unlimited resources, time, et cetera. Write all that down. Um, and then you kind of want to perform a sort of triage, I think, where you think about what's really feasible given <laughs> time, resources, and now pandemic, right? So we've already had sort of res uh, field work data collection constraints, as Diana pointed out. We're just adding like a, a really horrific one to, to that list, right? So, you know, establish a, list, a wish list of what you want to do, then sort of go through and perform triage, if you, uh, if you will, as a, in, in terms of thinking about what can I reasonably do now? Is there a part of my dissertation that I can use data that already exists or I can collect data that's online? I can use all of this new data that's being, being made available. And then sort of set aside parts that you, you want to try to do for the future. So one of my graduate students has um, sort of a three chapter set up um, and she's created four chapters, right? So she has three chapters that she can do with data she's already collected and a fourth chapter that will require sort of qualitative speaking to actors on the ground. And she's going to do it if, you know, that if, if she's able to in the future, but she's, she's decided that this is the fourth, this is sort of on my wish list, but it's further down the list, right? Um, by the way, this is kind of how I recommend doing field work anyway, setting up a, a wish list of all the, the people you want to speak to, the things you want to do, and then keeping careful track of who you speak to, um, if something doesn't work out, why it doesn't work out, if you had to change your research question, excuse me, if you have to change your interview questions or um, your focus group protocol, halfway through, what are the changes you made? Why did you make those changes? So essentially you're just keep, keeping careful track of what you wanna do and then what you end up doing and, and you sort of work iteratively back and forth between those two lists. Okay, finally, <laughs> perhaps the, the most difficult stage, I think, are you halfway through collecting your research? You have some data, but you don't have enough, you think, um, to, get, to get you to, to write the full dissertation or to finish the full project. Um, at this point, I would say, if you haven't already done so, um, assess what you have, the data that you have, assess what you can do with that data, as Yuki pointed out, and then assess what you still might need moving forward. So one option is to ask if you can reasonably convert what was face-to-face -face data collection to online data collection, sort of replicate what you did on the ground online. Um, now, there are a lot of resources about doing online research that I think we'll be making available to you. Um, and you can think about sort of the, the, the advantages and disadvantages, um, how it if differs from face-to-face -face collection, and decide if you can replicate and sort of add to your data by switching to the online version. If you think maybe that's not possible, um, then I think the next question you have to ask is, can you see data collection as being iterative, right? So you've collected one set of data and you have some findings. And so now you're gonna do sort of a second data collection with online, which might require um, changing some of the questions you ask, changing how you collect the data. But you can use that sort of second set of data to, to either triangulate or to revise things that you collected earlier. And you know, when I was in the data collection process, when I was collecting field work, when I was collecting data in the field, um, I was not fortunate enough to get a really big grant that would allow me to go for two years. <laughs> um, I got lots of small grants that allowed me to go for three months here and six months there and five months there over a two year process. And I actually thought that that worked better for me because A, I was um, forced to be very efficient when I was on the ground. A year feels like a really long time when you're in the field and, and suddenly, you know, 10 months have passed and you haven't done what you want to do. When you know you only have two or three months, you can be really efficient, right? But it also forced me to, you know, after a first round of data collection, to look at what I had collected, think about what I had collected, think of if my hypotheses are starting to make sense, if other alternatives are coming or seem to be, to be emerging. And so that iterative process of, of gathering data, analyzing the data, and then moving forward could, I think, be applied to this stage of, of, of data collection. And um, if there isn't a silver lining, I think, to this, but 
<laughs> Diana said that, and I actually had this in my notes, silver lining, and then in parentheses, if we can call it that, is that you know this process is gonna really force you to be on top of your data. Um, even when my sort of spurts of data collection that I did, I would you know, have 10 interviews in a week, and it was just overwhelming to look at that data, so I would just set it aside, and I'll get to it later, I'll get to it later, and then suddenly you have pages and pages, of, or hours and hours of, of uh, audio to listen to, right, or video to listen to. And I think now, with, with these sorts of challenges we face in a pandemic, you're gonna be forced to stay on top of your data, to sort of look at it and analyze it as you go along, and I think it's actually gonna be much more efficient for you. Um, I don't know if that's a silver lining, but it's, it's something that I think you could be forced to do and that might actually help you um, um, moving forward. Last thing, tools that can potentially help you in terms of thinking about how you can move forward. Um, pursuing some sort of collaborative methodology, right? Identifying stakeholders on the ground, um, identifying academics on the ground, who will help you, you know, collaborative methodology is not just, could you do this for me? It's, um, this is my research question, you know, is it interesting to you? Do you see some applications for your work? Can we think about this together? Um, this is, collaborative methodology as an approach is much easier to do early on, I think, um, but, but um, and it still might require sort of face-to-face -face interaction that perhaps your, your collaborator on the ground in the field, um, is what I'm thinking here, um, could help with the face-to-face -face sort of work. Um, but this would be thinking about sort of couching your dissertation and perhaps, or one element of your dissertation in, into a bigger project with which you can collaborate with that person. Um, something Yuki, Yuki mentioned, identifying potential co-authors um, not for your dissertation, of course, but thinking about, again, situating your dissertation in sort of a broader agenda, research agenda. If you only have online data collected, if you're at that stage where you've collected online data um, and you're evaluating it, share it with data, with social scientists on the ground in your country. Make sure that what you're seeing, they're seeing, you know, thinking about sort of validating your interpretations with, with academics that, um, that have the experience and that sense of place on the ground. Um, and then a couple of problems that we'll probably talk about. <laughs> um, IRB review, it's unclear how these things are changing. You know, what is, how, how can we do online work? What are the ethics um, uh, of, of sort of participant research in this, in this sort of new era? Um, do we have to think about new kinds of methods training? I mean, the lucky thing here is that there's not a lot of qualitative methods training in the world to begin with. So, um, you know, uh, we just have to think a little bit more carefully about, except for IQMR, we have to think a little bit more carefully about how, how we do this. Um, and then finally, uh, and I think this is one of the biggest problems, is you know, a lot of the work we do is gonna depend upon our potential subjects on the ground having access to phones or an on internet, like an online connection, right? And so, you know, is our population in terms of who we can reach automatically truncated because not everyone has access to the, to the internet. And that's one of the biggest problems, I think, how we access those populations that are perhaps the most vulnerable um, that maybe don't, um, don't have easy access to, to Zoom as we all happily, luckily do. And I'll just leave it there, thanks. Great, thank you so much, Jim. Um, great ideas, and I'm really trying to hold myself back from not saying some things, but I will continue to be successful doing that, and I will turn it over to Pia um, to tell us a little bit more about uh, some exploratory research. Right. Wonderful. Thanks, everyone. So Stephen uh, Gleiserman will talk about how to actually implement service in the times of COVID in a moment. And before we go there, I want to um, talk about exploratory fieldwork if you're taking sort of a mixed quant qual approach um, where you use more qualitative approaches to really wrap your head around the problem that you're studying and then maybe at a later stage use quantitative methods to test them on a larger scale and 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 so many of you probably have a general idea of the topic you want to study, but some of you may not yet have nailed down their theoretical argument, the research design, and the survey questions that, that you want to use. Um, and so oftentimes we call this exploratory stage the, the soak and poke, um, where researchers sort of spend time in the field and talk to as many people as possible to wrap their head around the issues and develop their theoretical hunches before then later on testing them more systematically. 
Bob Bates, I think, has a very useful uh, distinction of the research process as sort of three steps. The first is you develop your intuitions, your contextual knowledge. The second is then you formalize these in intuitions or develop your theoretical argument. And then third, you test them more systematically. Um, so how do you get to the systematic testing stage? How do you get to the point where you can then actually sort of roll out your survey on a larger scale if that is the type of research that you're doing? So like many other things, COVID has made this more challenging, but not impossible. So in addition to the tips that Jen and Yuri have um, offered, um, let me um, add some practical suggestions. So beyond, of course, poring over existing data sets, reading and synthesizing the related literature, what can you do? So usually at this stage, we, we, we go to the field and we get embedded, right? So as Jen has mentioned, um, you can actually do a lot of that from your office. Um, usually when you get to a field site, you would probably want to talk to your cab driver and ask all the questions you can, very hard at the moment, right? But the other thing you would probably do is read the local news and follow relevant people on Twitter, right? And that is very much something that you can do from anywhere in the world. Second, um, you would probably build uh, your local networks. Um, and that is incredibly important and maybe even more important right now, right? So every country, I would argue, um, has a group of researchers who are often very, very collegial. And so in, a, in a, one of the very important tasks that you can do right now, or you may already have done to some extent and you can build further, is to talk to researchers working in your countries and in particular identify active research organizations. Um, and, you know, one way of doing this might be to ask for a faculty for intros. You can reach out if people, so most of my work is in Uganda, if people reach out to me and say like, hey, I'm interested in studying X, Y, and Z for my dissertation in Uganda. Do you have any suggestions on whom I would talk, could talk to? Um, I would be happy to field those questions. And I would guess that most people working in other contexts um, would do the same. So when you do this kind of exploratory fieldwork, who do you typically talk to, right? Well, one, you typically talk to the people whose behavior you're actually interested in studying. So those could be politicians, bureaucrats, ordinary people, voters, right? Um, the other set um, of people you would probably talk to are key informants, right? People with aggregated knowledge about the behavior of the people you're interested in studying or the topic that you're interested in. And I would argue that the second are probably sort of a very good bet for, for digital to field work and might be easier to talk to at the moment than the, the people whose behavior you're actually studying. Why? Well, one, there it's it can be particularly efficient, right? Because they already have a lot of knowledge. Um, and second, they might be more elite, which means they might be easier to interview remotely in terms of technology, but also in terms of language. Um, so finding the right people to talk to um, who are willing to share their time and, and to trust you with honest answer is, is not easy in the best of times, right? So how can you go about this right now? Well, one, you want to make it worth their time, right? Which can be about collaboration, which can be about compensation, um, which can be about knowledge exchange. Um, one group that um, I find incredibly helpful in talking to, whether I'm in the field or not, and that I think is often overlooked, is the field staff of larger research organizations, right? So these are people whose professional job it is, day in and day out, to talk to people, either for quantitative or surveys or for qualitative data collection. So these tend to be people who have a lot of social science knowledge, right? These are also people who typically have university degrees and who are very used to conversing with researchers. So they can be great interlocutors, right? They're also at the moment, because there isn't much data collection going on, they might actually be quite willing to share their time with you. Um, and to build uh, connections for potential future collaboration once it is possible to collect data again um, and in person. And they might also, you know, they might be, in particular, if you compensate them for, your for their time, they might be quite, quite, quite happy to, um, to, to talk to you. So to give you an example, if you, so what I've just done, wrapping my head around a new project, is I've uh, implemented a Google survey uh, that asks a lot of exploratory questions about variation, um, in, in this case, social media use in rural areas. 
And then I, I have uh, worked with IPA Uganda very close. Well, actually, I, I, I founded IPA Uganda back in the day. And so I maintain very close relationships. But, but that, that's not a, like exclusive privilege or anything, right? So I then reached out to IPA Uganda um, and asked them, well, would you be willing to circulate this link to the survey with this message among your enumerators and your field staff, which are hundreds and hundreds, right? Um, and this, and then we, we do a lottery to compensate people fairly for their time and use this to get a sense of variation in social media use in rural areas. Um, but also to identify key informants, right? So some responses are a lot more thoughtful than others. Um, you can also use this to get a sense of variation, right? Some places have a lot of use for political purposes, some don't. So you can use this to select respondents who can then tell you more about the types of locales that you're interested in and, and sort of have a sense of the variation, right? And then follow up if they're willing to with, with a more in-depth qualitative interview or phone call. So that's just one idea of sort of tapping in a lot of the, the, the knowledge that is, that is there, right? Um, in addition, you might want to talk to civil society organizations and local researchers. Um, I would imagine that if you just send an email, a polite email saying like, hey, I would normally be in the country right now. Unfortunately, that's obviously not possible. But would you have time for a phone call instead? Um, and then have your call and then also can you recommend folks I could talk about the topic that I'm interested in again consider compensating them for their time or make it worthwhile right we, we don't want to be extractive here snowball sampling can be a very effective strategy for finding key respondents um, this is of course especially important when it comes to more sensitive topics I would recommend asking respondents which platform they're most comfortable with. This could be Skype, this could be phone, this could be WhatsApp calls, this could be signal calls, especially for more sensitive topics where you might want to have a high level of encryption. But the, use, uh, the important point here, I would think, is to use whatever platform your respondents, well, one, are able to access, but two, are, are comfortable using with and, and speaking relatively freely on. Um, one trick I wanted to share about actually sort of focusing respondents on the topics that you want to talk about um, can be to combine methods from quantitative and qualitative. So I often uh, do what I think of as sort of qualitative survey experiments in a sense, where I give people vignettes. So say, for example, you're interested in a hypothesis that mayors in more ethnically diverse places are more likely to play the ethnic card, just for sake of argument, right? So one approach to get at this um, could be to give your respondent two hypothetical villages. One is ethnically diverse, one is ethnically homogeneous, among other attributes, right? So you sort of paint the pictures of these two types of places. And then you ask your respondents, well, which of these hypothetical mayors do you think is more likely to play the ethnic card and why? Right? So that can be a, a sort of an approach to get your respondents to talk about the mechanisms. Well, one, to, to check your intuition, your, your hypothesis, but second, to sort of get at the underlying mechanisms. So finally, um, another reason to reach out to local research organizations in particular is that they have obviously a much better sense of what's currently feasible in terms of data collection. Right? The, the environment is changing so quickly. And I, I have to say, I, I find that the ivory tower feels very much like a tower these days. Um, and so this is all the more reason to reach out to local research organizations because they have a much better sense of what's currently feasible in terms of data collection. So they may have access to sample frames for phone or online surveys. They know about the local health regulations, about the local norms. They are currently doing studies or preparing to do studies. Right? And so with that said, I want to hand over to Steve Glazerman from IPA, who is actively working with researchers in, in IPA's 16 country offices to implement phone and online surveys right now. So he's really the person you want to hear from. OK, thank you, Pia. Go, Steve. Oh, wait. Oh, sorry. I was supposed to say something. Um, we only have two lonely questions in the Q&A. So if everybody could please jump in. Um, we got your, uh, many of you uh, offered us questions uh, through the Google form that we distributed. So many thanks to them. We're trying to wrap some of the answers into what we're saying now, but we know we're not going to be able to hit on anything. So if we haven't yet hit on your question and you want to just copy it right into the Q&A, that would be great. But we would really love for the, for the last half hour or so of this to be us really helping you with some of the, your biggest challenges. So please do jump into the Q&A and, and give us some, uh, some, some grist for our mill. And with that, I will turn it over to Steve. Okay, great. 
Um, well, uh, thanks for inviting me here, and, and um, uh, I hope I can provide some input to some of the, the difficult uh, circumstances that you're all facing, you, the, the resilient generation, the resilient cohort, as you'll, I'm sure, be known. Um, so, um, I mentioned before that IPA is, um, you know, has 22 country offices. We're typically running over 200 RCTs in a given time. So in mid-March, when a lot of that came screeching to a halt, um, we immediately um, explored pivoting to phone surveys uh, or remote survey methods. Um, now, by remote survey methods, um, we're talking primarily about um, CADI, which many of you probably know is survey lingo for computer-assisted telephone interviewing or um, uh, you know, just traditional phone interviews. Um, but it also includes uh, SMS and IVR. So SMS is just text messaging. IVR stands for interactive voice response. That's basically robocall surveys. Um, with SMS and IVR surveys, uh, you know, those are really useful for high frequency surveys or if you have like a, a you want to get, um, you're only able to ask like, you know, three or four questions at a time. Um, but, but with high frequency or large volume, uh, because it can be uh, quite, those are useful for things like, um, uh, you know, time use studies or dietary intake or anything that has that sort of recall element that you'd want to um, get frequent measurements of. Um, the other uh, approach is using uh, web surveys. I'm not going to talk as much about um, self-administered web surveys, although I've done several of them myself. Um, it's uh, mainly because IPA doesn't, you don't really need IPA to do web surveys. Uh, so we haven't really been, you can do that from your dining room table. Um, what, what we what we do is really give the in-country presence and local knowledge uh, to do uh, field work. And that includes for phone surveys, um, you know, having the languages required, being able to switch languages if you're a multilingual um, context or, or having a very, uh, a phone, um, a phone bank that has the ability to, to reassign cases based on language fairly smoothly. Um, so if you're working in Ghana or somewhere that has, um, uh, you know, multiple languages and you just really need to switch, that's, that's a consideration. So we had ambitions to do a lot of multi-mode stuff with SMS and IVR. We ended up focusing almost exclusively on CADI surveys, um, using SMS messages mainly for pre and post survey contacts to maintain sample or to increase uh, response rates. Um, so what do you need to know about CADI surveys? Um, well, the first question is where do you get your, your sample? Um, so, um, a common one is just following up from an in-person sample. Like a lot of people had, uh, research started, uh, when the lockdowns began. And so they had a baseline. And so it's a really useful way to get midline and end line. Uh, if you were thought, you know, if you had sort of had the foresight to collect information on, on phone numbers. Um, but uh, the other approach is, if you don't have that, is to use some other list, recontacting a sample that was assembled for some other reason, um, like another study or uh, from administrative data. So I want to caution that this is um, tricky. Um, there are legal and ethical considerations. Um, I generally advise against it because it's, um, you, first of all, you need the rights and data to the phone list uh, from the donor that, that sponsored its collection or uh, PIs. Or the government agency, if it was, if if, uh, if appropriate, um, and you need consent from the respondents themselves. So you have to go back and look at the consent language and see if it actually allows for recontacting for the purposes you intend or reconsenting for a new purpose. Um, and um, and that's important, uh, both for ethical reasons, but also because there are these negative externalities. Which if we're um, calling people without their consent or you know taking uh, you know, b based on their having provided a number for another purpose, you know, some other study, then in future, any researchers will um, run into difficulties because respondents will understandably uh, be mistrustful that you're going to share their information with third parties and they're going to get spammed. Um, fortunately, we don't see a lot of this in most um, low and middle income countries that we work in. It's, it's already happened in the U.S. And, and response rates to phone surveys have been declining steadily. Uh, uh, over the years in the U.S. 
for that reason. Um, the other um, approach that's fairly common, we've been doing a lot of these, is random digit dialing. Um, RDD doesn't require that you have a list. You're literally you know, using admissible numbers that work um, for um, you know, the geographic area that you're calling in, hopefully. Um, and there's a lot to share about RTT sampling uh, uh, survey methods. Um, it, it really is like now it's, it's very popular and very, you know, um, it solves a lot of problems. It also has a lot of its, its own uh, problems. So um, first you need to, I mean, you, you could literally use random numbers, but what's commonly done is, is purchasing a list of numbers from a no, mobile number operator or from a third party vendor. So at IPA, we try to use sample solutions. Um, we've had really good results with them. Um, they're in a lot of countries, but not all. So we use other uh, providers like Ablame in Colombia, and, and I forget the name of the one vendor in Mexico, but it's probably okay because their list was not that good. So you really want the numbers to be as fresh as possible. What these, what these companies do is they pre-pulse the numbers so you have a high percentage of, of working numbers. Um, if you were do, studying migrant populations, um, there, it's a little bit harder because, uh, so for instance, in, if you're trying to study um, Syrian migrants in Lebanon, um, a lot of people get their phone service in Lebanon is very is expensive, and a lot of people get their service through the black market vendors who are using numbers typically from Eastern Europe. So, um, you know, you'll have a lot of Estonian numbers in your, in your list if you're using a list that you um, collected from in-person data collection. And so, you know, that complicates things. You can't use random digit dialing in that, um, in that setting, or at least if you do, you'll miss a lot of the population that you're interested in, um, uh, in migrants. Um, or they may have phones from their home country that, uh, that still work in the, um, in the host country. Um, but the big hurdle is, is getting uh, pickups and, and cooperation. And you will get low response rates. If you're used to doing field research and face-to-face and, and -face data collection and getting 90, 95, 100% response rates, you will have to get used to 60, 40, 20% response rates. If you're doing RDD, and um, you, especially if you have screening criteria, like you want to interview women or you want to interview people in rural areas, you know, you're going to have to make a lot of calls um, to get a small, to get a reasonable size sample. Um, and there are some countries, um, you have to be aware of local regulations. In some countries, um, the consent script has to be extra detailed because of local data protection regulations. So if you're working in Kenya or Nigeria, um, they have um, tough new uh, data protection regulations. Uh, Peru has adopted a similar DPR. Um, it, <clears throat> we um, uh, have been doing experimentation with a number of phone survey methods designed to increase response rates and response quality. Um, and uh, so one of those things obviously is using pre-survey um, contacts like SMS messages. Um, you can use pre-survey text messages to increase response rates um, uh, by, well, let's say, we're, we're still doing this research, still, still cleaning and analyzing the data, but from the five or six countries data that I've looked at so far, we're, we're getting like a two or three percentage point bump in response rates from pre-survey SMS, which makes it worth it in our view. Um, we've also been running a series of experiments on the content of the messages, both in the pre-survey SMS as well as the intro you know, recruitment consent script. Um, so we don't have findings to share yet, but um, I can tell you like from the first set of appeals that we used, the content didn't matter. Um, we're now testing uh, different um, contrasts and messaging uh, to appeal to different um, you know, self-interests and um, efficacy by providing results from previous waves and so on. Uh, monetary incentives comes up a lot as a question. Um, there's a lot of research saying that monetary incentives matter, but it's just offering them, not, not necessarily offering large incentives or increasing them. So you get really rapidly diminishing returns. So the, really the most cost-effective approach is to provide some kind of monetary incentive, usually through uh, airtime. We typically offer about something equivalent to a dollar um, for most of our surveys. Um, where we're doing that. Um, and other factors to improve response rates are, um, and response quality and interviewer productivity have to do with the time of day that calls are made, the number of attempts, the spacing of attempts. So we've been doing a lot of um, uh, research on our own processes to try to um, get better information and, and we'll be publishing that information because um, there's really very little that's written about 
low and middle income countries you know, in recent years. Uh, a lot of the data that we have to understand how to do a good job at, at reaching hard to reach populations and getting hard, getting uh, addressing uh, coverage bias, which is really big. Even though mobile phone penetration rates are high, not everybody has connectivity, not everybody has, um, has the power to keep their, their devices charged. Um, and so obviously the most vulnerable members of society, the ones who are gonna be least connected. And, um, and so that coverage bias is, is a real concern. So we're also doing work on, on whether remote surveys are representative, um, especially if you have really low response rates. Um, I mean, it'd be fine if they're random, uh, with respect to the outcomes that you're measuring, but we're trying to ground truth phone survey data by comparing the findings to um, DHS or LSMS statistics, embedding common questions in the phone survey from these sort of large scale in person um, uh, data collections where we think we should know the distribution of the population of interest. Um, and, you know, of course, we, um, it, it is a difficult thing to study because there are also mode effects that can be confounded with. Um, the composition effect, which is what we're really concerned about here. Um, survey length. Um, when you're doing uh, phone surveys, we, we're, we've been, we're developing a lot of like written guidance, but I can tell you like, it's hard to get, you really should design surveys that are more like 15 to 20 minutes instead of the hour long, two hour long uh, surveys that you see people doing um, with in-person uh, data collection. Um, uh, Anecdotally, we have been able to keep people on the phone for 45 minutes or over an hour in, for example, in Bangladesh, uh, early in the lockdown, when people at home, they're out of work. It's sort of an unusual time. Um, and we were getting relatively high cooperation. I don't know if that'll last. More typically, you'll get 15 minutes, 20 minutes, maybe, maybe 30 with compliant populations or engaging content of the survey. Um, the questionnaire, it's engaging, not too cognitively demanding or, or sensitive or intrusive, you'll likely do better. But again, that's something that we're uh, doing methodological research right now uh, in conjunction with um, Northwestern University and um, our research methods initiative. So hopefully we'll have some outputs to share in the coming weeks and months. Um, for some other issues around privacy, um, if, you know, one of the things we're generally not, I mean, there's a great interest right now in understanding the effects of COVID-19 on um, uh, uh, people who are vulnerable to intimate partner violence uh, because they're confined in a, in a space under stressful uh, uh, circumstances. But this is precisely the kind of data collection that's difficult to do when um, you know, people are living in small spaces and you don't know whether they are, um, um, you know, have the privacy to speak candidly. Um, and you can't observe their nonverbal cues, uh, their, their, their body language, um, and so, um, we're developing, you know, some approaches to sort of try to, well, one of the things that we're doing is trying to analyze um, audio audit data that, that measures everything about the sound level and the conversational pattern to, um, to try to train an algorithm to determine whether somebody is, you know, whether there's other people in the room or whether there's, you know, whether the respondent is attentive or distracted. Um, so again, that's also uh, on the agenda. Um, and if you're doing RDD, of course, there it's, it's very difficult to get a representative sample of women, especially in societies where uh, male household members are more likely to be the one who owns the phone and holds the phone. Um, so um, that was probably a lot more depressing than um, than uplifting, and which I, for which I apologize. I, I will um, sort of advertise that we are trying to share some of the lessons that we're learning on. Um, uh, uh, our sort of recover landing page recover is an acronym uh, that is basically it's, it's um, the sort of project where we're uh, aggregating information from a large number of studies uh, on COVID response um, but it also my part of it is focusing on methods so we have a questionnaire repository so if you're writing a questionnaire you want to understand impact on on COVID um, impact of COVID on, on households, whatever, you can um, see what other people are using in their questionnaires, um, find a module that's similar to yours if you want to harmonize language or get ideas for questionnaire design. Um, I can add a link to it in the chat, do that in a minute. Um, and also um, on that same site in, like I said, the coming weeks, we're going to be launching uh, or making available some um, 
uh, the findings from the methods work and um, as well as um, practical tips and advice on how to do um, you know phone surveys and other kinds of uh, remote surveying methods in pandemic conditions and then I know I want to give time for questions so I'm just going to say one last thing which is really about um, you know as, as, as we're doing all this activity we've launched 60 phone surveys we've been doing all this methods work around uh, phone survey research um, I'm also part of this group that's uh, we're, we've been leading IPA's return to in-person field work uh, policy we're about to release it and um, it's going to discuss how we intend to proceed safely and where in doing field research. Um, and it's pretty exciting because we, there, uh, you know, I'll share that there's, it's going to be more possible in, in mostly in sub-Saharan Africa than in Asia or Latin America right now. But um, it, it contains sort of both our internal guidelines and our sort of, you know, we have a whole set of like ethical considerations and practical considerations about transportation and personal protective equipment and, and referrals for, for symptomatic individuals or sharing information, public health information with people who might not otherwise, you know, be aware of, of the pandemic status in their, uh, in their local area, um, where to recruit enumerators from, you know, how to, you know, uh, uh, monitor field work and know when to halt it. So all of those, uh, that policy and guidance is gonna be released pretty soon. And so um, we'll also have a, a dashboard uh, a country status dashboard that tells you which countries were most likely to be able to launch field work in sooner. Um, and then like, you know, green, yellow, red, and then the red countries are, are the ones where um, it's just gonna take longer. Um, and we're monitoring government restrictions, uh, status of the, of the outbreaks, um, and a host of other factors that uh, affect, not just like whether you can do field research, but the, um, uh, the additional costs so for instance, you might have higher uh, cost for transportation by, you know, because the usual public transport isn't gonna be a good option, or you might need more lead time for approvals because, you know, IPA has its institutional approvals. Um, we've been interacting with a lot of IRBs to understand how they're gonna interpret, um, what kind of amendments they're gonna require and what kind of protocols are gonna be um, suitable for conducting safe, um, ethical uh, research. Um, and so that none of us is responsible for, um, you know, being a vector for a new outbreak in a, in a fragile um, system. So with that, uh, we, maybe we should, I should stop there and we should um, go to questions. Great, wonderful. Thank you, Steve, and thank you for to everybody for these for these fantastic insights. As, um, as I said, I'll just say I don't. I want to leave the rest of the time for questions. I just want to say uh, two quick things. One is. It strikes me how much of this advice is advice that's germane to all kinds of field work under any circumstances. I mean, practically everything that I heard was like, that's a good idea whether we're having a pandemic or not. Um, but a lot of it is, it, it keys off what Yuki said. You're going to end up having a shorter timeline probably to do what you need to do. So following all of that advice about the preparation um, and also about the, about, um, iteration, right? Switching from data collection to data analysis to possibly changing something about your research design and around again. Then Reed and Lauren McLean and I are writing a paper about that that I'm totally excited about um, that's going into a journal uh, this week, hopefully. Um, but all of those sorts of things, that all of the advice that you heard is really good advice no matter whether you're um, in this situation and more generally. So um, please, please do think a good bit about what the, what the panelists said in particular about um, preparation and iteration. The other thing that we didn't talk much about, but I think it's certainly worth considering, um, is thinking about the importance of sharing any data that you can coming out of your work, right? Right now we see the, you know, the, the more qualitative and quantitative data that there were out there available for people, the easier it would be for all of us to operate now because we would, we would have more sources um, of data potentially relevant to our research uh, subjects. So just be thinking about all of these things that I am managing to collect, might they be helpful to somebody else and might I be able to share some of them, all of them, a part of them safely, ethically, responsibly, but might there be a way that you could help others through the, through the work that you're doing? Um, and with that, I will just turn it right over to Annie Marshall, who is going to um, uh, be managing our Q&A. I see we have 15 questions, so that's great. So Andy, take it away. All right, uh, thank you so much, Diana and panelists, and uh, thank you all for your questions. Um, as we pointed out, you can access, if you have more questions, you can access the Q&A panel down below. Um, and even if you're not planning to ask a question, 
um, feel free to go look at the questions and push the uh, thumbs up to upvote ones that you would be more interested in hearing from the panel on, um, because obviously we're not going to get to all the questions. Um, I think just to start out, based on a couple of the questions um, in the Q&A right now and quite a few of the questions that were submitted in advance, um, I think we want to talk about um, the ethics of doing research um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and this is open to anyone on the panel, but grouping a couple of um, the salient questions on this topic. Um, one, and I think Diana just alluded to this in her comments, is what are we learning from um, adapting our research to the pandemic that are th lessons we can take even going forward after um, the pandemic or you know, normal research? Um, and then more specifically on um, the ethics of doing research in more vulnerable areas like much of the global south um, during the pandemic, remotely or otherwise. And then a more specific question on um, what about research clearances, ethical clearances, and um, specifically on whether remote, what types of remote research um, would require um, in, in, in host country um, ethical permission, um, as well as working with your own institution's IRB. So that's uh, open to anyone. Anybody wanna jump in on that one? Pia, go ahead. Yeah, I can, I can jump in. I mean, I would think that whether it's remote or in-person research is probably subject to the exact same rules and regulations as, as in-person work is, right? Of course, the, I mean, it, it's less enforceable in a way, right? Because one of, one of the reasons or one of the situations in which you really need that letter from the local IOP is when you introduce yourself to a village and they say like, hey, where's your, where's your letter, where's your research clearance? So you really, really got to have it, right? Um, whereas for uh, remote interviews, that of course is much less likely, I would still very much uh, uh, encourage everyone to get, to be respectful of the local norms and uh, regulations and still get all the research clearances that you got to get. Of course, then, then there is this tricky question, sort of if you're doing sort of exploratory work, so when does, when does systematic research actually start, right? Which is a really tricky question to which I don't have a good answer, but I think that is something to discuss with, with your advisors, with your faculty, with people who are um, used to doing research in this country, about what is actually, at what point does your research that sort of asking questions, talking to people, right, start to become the type of systematic research that actually requires a local research. And to that list of people with whom you might interact about this, I would just add your IRB, and I'm, I'm sure that's not going to be the most, pos the most um, popular suggestion that anybody ever made, because we tend to think of IRBs as problematic and obstacles, um, but they are really, I'm doing actually a research project on IRBs and how they think about um, data and data sharing, and they are actually really struggling with this and what some of the differences are um, and what it, and, and, and how you get consent in a meaningful way and all these kinds of things. As, as, this, as this kicked into gear, they kicked into gear with considering those questions, anticipating that research was going to switch online. So I think Pia is absolutely right. Talk to people who have done research in the, in the context, because part of what you'll be doing is educating your IRB. IRB, but they may also have some ideas about how this will work and you'll put together the local knowledge and their knowledge about how this works and hopefully come out with a really workable uh, with a workable protocol. Yuki, do you want to add something? Yeah, I just had one um, <coughs> point that I just thought of. Um, so I think there's this, um, at least in my work, so I do a lot of work in, in Southeast Asia um, in conflict zones and what I've actually found is my local interlocutors are oftentimes almost desensitized to risk uh, to their own safety. Um, and so I think just seeing how this might map onto COVID, um, in fact, one of my, one of my good friends, he's a, uh, this French guy who has worked a lot on, on research projects in the Asia Foundation, the World Bank. Um, and he was actually taken hostage one time um, during some work, but he's completely de desensitized. And then actually we were talking about um, conducting research at one point um, a couple of months ago. And he basically was like, yeah, you know, we're ready to go. And, I'm, and I was just thinking, you know, um, it's important, even if your interlocutors are ready to start conducting field work, 
to put the brakes on um, from your own perspective, thinking, okay, what are the risks to the people there uh, that you're you're sort of putting um, your own interlocutors uh, who may not really appreciate the risks in the same way, um, or you know they're just completely desensitized. I mean, this ha happened in in Mindanao to me as well, where I was interacting with folks who you know were used to bombs going off all the time, and I said we have to shut things down and. You know, th this kind of thing, I think it's important to err on the side of risk aversion, even if the people on the ground are really pushing for it. Um, and that's the one thing that I'll say, because, you know, if we completely rely on their local, ex them as local experts of the conditions on the ground, um, we're also abdicating some responsibility. And I think it's important to, to not completely um, let that go. Go ahead, Andy. Oh, I was going to say, Jen, were you planning to answer for that? No, I think we should go on to another question. Oh. Okay. Um, yeah, our top uh, question right now, and we just got um, another related one towards the bottom. Um, our top question, or one of our top questions right now, is for Pia um, to talk a little bit about um, compensation um, for uh, respondents. Um, and then there's a related question um, at the bottom for Stephen um about um funding for compensation um especially now is it is maybe it's higher or what what the procedures for that would be um so we'll start with pia and then go to steven and then if anyone else wants to jump in on this one yeah sure um yeah so how do you find the right amount of compensation right um well it's it's hard um i think of this in terms of opportunity costs so our goal is to one get the respondents to agree to the interview but second, not regret it afterwards once they really know what kind of questions you asked and how long it took, right? And so the latter, of course, is the, the, the answer is just to be very upfront about, about the, the topics you're going to discuss and, and the duration that it's going to take. Um, if we talk about financial um, compensation, the way I think about it is what would this respondents typically make in the time it takes to do the interview? Um, this, of course, might vary across different groups of respondents. So there I would find an average. Um, for, for this and many other reasons, it can be very, very helpful, regardless of whether we're in pandemic times or not, to hire a local research assistant um, compensated at maybe slightly above the market rates um, in, in country um, who can help with finding this type of information, right? Um, so how much, how much would this group of respondents actually make? in the 20 minutes or the hour or the two hours of your time. Uh, Jen has a two finger. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Were you done? I, I'll, no, when you no, I'll, I'll, keep going. So for quantitative service, um, one thing to think about is to turn this into a lottery, right? So you might, if you have 50 or 100 respondents, it can be hard to pay every, every single one of them. And so here, the way I think about it is in terms of average payout, right? Expected payout. So for example, for I just did this 10 minute Google survey that I mentioned. Um, and so there, what we did, um, we say, well, this is gonna take 10 minutes of your time and we're gonna do a lottery of 10 times 10,000 shillings, which is about $3. And then if we get a lot of responses, we'll, we'll lottery more um, bundles of airtime, which you can pay very easily um, through World Remit, for example, right? You, you can send mobile money um, or, or airtime to, to phones. So that's quite easy to do. Um, but of course, it's not just about the money, right? Um, it's about, with local researchers, I would say it's also very much about a knowledge exchange, having an interesting and a respectful conversation with another researcher in another country with a different, with a different perspective. And, and then finally, in terms of sort of reducing the cost for them, I would also think about hard again about a time and a platform that works for them to make it um, as convenient, as comfortable and risk-free for them as possible, right? So how do you balance this with ensuring that respondents don't take undue risk in terms of exposure to COVID, uh, Haley asked, which I think is an excellent question. So I was thinking about remote interviews. Of course, this gets really tricky uh, for in-person interviews in current times. Uh, my take would be to only do in-person interviews if you are confident that the risk is sufficiently low. Now, what does that mean is really, you know, 
you have to tailor it to the to the local context but the things to consider here i would say are one the COVID rates in in the area um uh, actual confirmed or or uh, estimated right um then during the interview can you is is it possible to keep a distance does your uh, your interviewer wear ppe and then but very important and this is easy to forget also the travel right so if your respondent has to travel to the interview destination is that actually risky for them so those are all things to to keep in mind and i would think that um similar to what yuki was saying i think we as as researchers should really err on the conservative side and make sure that the risk of doing an interview um, for us is lower than what people would face in their in their day-to-day -day life and might be lower what they they might be willing to incur can i Jen. can i just build on that quickly before um turning over to the other question for steven um i i was thinking about there was another question about sort of overburdening our interlocutors and and how we sort of compensate them and and especially in a context where you may not have the money to do so i think there's other ways to compensate not just even just for interlocutors but for potentially for people you're interviewing or subjects that you that you identify um so you know sharing your time in one way or another with them uh some other skill that you have it might be translation translating something into english sharing your work on the ground um, sharing some sort of expertise you have in a more formal setting perhaps with a with a civil society group on the ground um, in some cases with research associates on the ground, they may have research questions that you can somehow integrate into your project so they feel invested in what's happening. Um, so there are ways to involve, I think, um, especially interlocutors on the ground where they don't feel like they're being exploited, but they feel like they're part of the process or they're getting something that's sort of equally valuable to them that may not be monetary, but, but could be something else that you offer uh, to them or to their, to their peers. Yuki, you want to jump in and then we'll go to Steve if that's a two finger real quick. Yeah, I, I was going to say something very similar, um, which is I often like when I'm talking to my interlocutors, I, I'm very upfront and saying, look, what are your goals? What are you trying to get out of this? Um, and sometimes it is money, but oftentimes it's not. It's, it's about connections to, you know, U.S. academia, for example, or maybe help on their own research or feedback on research that they've I've uh, been conducting um, and so it's it's kind of thinking about what you can offer them um, and being very upfront about it. I think I would second what both Pia and Jennifer are saying. Great, Steve over to you. Yeah, I'm, I'm sort of having a hard time figuring out which question to answer. I've been reading the ones in the uh, Q&A box and 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 then th there was a multi-parter I think part of which was directed at me so um, I, I think uh, Going to be the most helpful here. I mean, most of what I was, what I've been talking about is is uh, relevant for quantitative data collection more so than than qualitative data. So I'll sort of stay there and say, um, I mean, I'm not sure if I'm understanding the compensation question, but you know, I mentioned before that it's typical when you're uh, interviewing you know, household members or farmers, whatever, by phone, that you can just transfer airtime as as a way to compensate uh, respondents. But that's a token uh, compensation. I think really. The most important, and this may be sort of consistent with what Yuki was saying, um, uh, the, the literature suggests and our recent experience suggests that uh, it's very important to pay attention to the non-monetary incentives. Um, how engaging is the survey? How relevant does it feel? Does it feel intrusive? Um, and uh, particularly, um, you know, we're, we're right now experimentally testing uh, some recruitment messaging for multi-wave surveys where we're giving some kind of results from previous waves, you know, like tidbit of this is how your responses are influencing, you know, policy or improving uh, the response to COVID to see if that has any um, uh, results in improvement in cooperation rates, response rates, uh, response quality. So, um, yeah, I don't know if there's a, if that was getting at the question, but I feel like, um, the if the question is about well, some questions here about funding too i mean one thing i would just point out is that um phone surveying typically is going to be cheaper than than in person um but you also may have to do more waves of it and the cost of and then once you do go back in the field the cost is going to be higher than it was right um there's just more things transportation ppe um 
it, we, one thing that we've been struggling with is that we'd like to provide some additional income protection for uh, for numerators so that they have the right incentives to report when they are either um, symptomatic or exposed to somebody who's COVID symptomatic so as not to lose their, because they're going to lose their livelihood if they say, oh, I'm, I'm not feeling well. We take you off the survey. They're, they're paid on a daily basis. That's their livelihood gone. So they would have a disincentive to report, you know, really important information that we need to halt um, potentially spreading the, um, the virus. So uh, income protection, health uh, benefits, like we're looking into beefing those up for enumerators during this period. And that we have to have frank conversations with donors and say, if you want data now, this is this is what's required to do it safely. Um, and I know that's really tough for graduate students to hear because it's not like they have access to you know giant coffers of research funding. And then Pia wanted to say something on that. Right. On the on the fundraising, also to add to what Steve just said. Um, so it is in some respects harder to fundraise right now for research and research is getting more expensive for, for or in some aspects of research are getting more expensive as Steve pointed out. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that there is a lot of money for COVID related research at the moment for good reason, right? Because we really have to invest in building a stock of knowledge very quickly. So to the extent to which you can integrate COVID related projects and questions into your research plans, I think that can be a very um, efficient um, way of one, increasing your chances of getting funding, but also contributing to a stock of knowledge that we urgently need at the moment. So I think that can be a win-win. All right, thanks. So we still have time for one more question. So we're gonna go with the uh, question that's been upvoted the most still on the board here. Um, and that is, um, this multi-part question here about writing proposals and grant applications um, at this time. Uh, do any of the panelists have insights regarding how COVID will impact grant applications? Should we be concerned that funding for COVID will decrease the available resources for other research? Do you have any advice on how to write a successful proposal under the current circumstances, particularly considering that it is so hard to predict what will be possible at research sites in the relatively near future. So that's open to anyone on the panel. So I'll, can I just briefly jump in and say, um, first, I don't know about funding, but I suspect it's going to be harder in the future. I, the funding may be limited, and it probably would, I suspect, behoove you to, um, even if your question is not directly related to COVID, to talk about why it's important in a pandemic or post-pandemic world to understand this question, right? So somehow tie it in. Um, in one way or another. I remember when, remember when the NSF was only funding projects that were about e the economy or security. And so every, every grant application we had to somehow make about the economy or security. So this isn't really anything new, right? You, you have to be strategic and show the people who are giving you money, um, A, that it, it, it's a relevant research question. And so in a post-pandemic era, like the pandemic is still relevant, I think, pandemic, post-pandemic. And I also think you need to demonstrate that it's feasible to do the research that you want to do, right? So, you know, to what extent are you dependent upon face-to-face -face interaction in a place that has a lot of, that has a real high, you know, infection rate? Do you have a contingency plan if, you know, basically that, you know, I don't think the logic of who gets funded really changes, you know, they want to fund something that's relevant and they want to fund something that they know is feasible and will produce the outcomes that they say they're going to produce. So it's just incumbent upon you now, I think, to show that, this research can be done online safely, right? Or, and, and actually, you know, for example, if you're doing work in Latin America, you know, someone had asked a question about this, so I'm gonna to try to bring in other, other questions. You know, how do I get interview, interviews, right? No one's responding. Well, emailing in Latin America isn't gonna work. You need to contact them directly by phone via WhatsApp. Now that may be hard, right? But this is where you have to rely on mentors, people who've done research in a country that you wanna do research. I mean, it is so common to just send someone a WhatsApp, a text, say, hey, are you available to talk? And they will not, much more common, much more expected in terms of norms than, than an email, right? So you just have to demonstrate that you understand the norms of how research is done, that they're, it's possible to do them, I think, in a pandemic slash post-pandemic era. And, can, you know, and, that, and then I think you, you give yourself a good chance of getting, of getting funding. 
Let me add one point on the uh, on the prospectus on the and the proposal, um, and then let's see if anybody else also wants to jump in. So this goes back to something Jen and Yuki had both mentioned before about this sort of notion of flexible discipline, right? So you you want you want the proposal to look as if you have a research project and you know exactly how you're going to execute it, but at the same time it, you need to represent the idea that you are able to be flexible, realize there need to be contingencies, realize there might be choice points at which circumstances will dictate one choice or another. So it's a line that you have to walk. And I think it's a it's a skill that we all need to develop, but it's one that's acutely important right now is to be able to walk that line between I have a plan, I know what I'm doing, but I realize that it may I may need to be flexible and it may need to change slightly when I'm in the field. So that is not that's not a, a game plan for doing this. It's a way of thinking about it, right? How do you convince a funder that you both have an idea of what to do and are clued into what's going on, on the ground and able to be flexible and react to circumstances as they change? Um, and that's something I would grab my advisor and say, look, here's my idea that I want to get across. Can you read this thing? Did I, did I get it or did I err too much on the side of, I have no idea what's going to happen and I'm going to change things on the fly? Or I've, I'm in, a, in an ironclad thing and this is what I'm doing. You want a middle ground. and, and someone else reading your proposal will be a lot better able to evaluate whether you got there than, than, you, than you did. Um, but everybody, Yuri, um, uh, Pia, Yuki, Steve, any, any other ideas on the sort of the proposal prospectus front? I think I shared my thoughts in terms of, you know, being, being flexible and making sure that if you can integrate COVID related knowledge generation, because it's important right now and there is some money for it. Okay, so we're a little bit past our time. Um, I don't want to uh, abuse the generosity of our panelists from being with us today. So I think this has been great. I'm, I'm bummed that we didn't get some more of your questions, but we are all out here and, and I'm just going to now. Um, volunteer my the panelists. We are all out here happy to continue to help you send us send us a question, send us all a question, send some of us a question. Um, we're delighted to help you try to help you continue to help you as much as we can. We are, are going to post a series of resources on the IQMR website very soon. We'll send you an email when we've done so. Um, a bunch of resources underlying the different things that we've talked about today and, and some other things as well. Um, and we are really grateful to IQMR for hosting this event and to the Moynihan Institute of Global Affairs and the Maxwell School at Syracuse for supporting this webinar series. There's a series of four panels and we hope that you will attend as many of them as possible. Um, and we hope you have a great day and thanks again for coming.